Okay, great. Now we're recording. I'll share again. Um, so did anybody have any comments? Yes, you, Rochelle said she sees that definitely. Um, and it's, you know, kind of sad that we, we all see that we all, you know, feel that maybe we've even been, a, you know, someone who's done that before. And, you know, now learning about this. Um, am I frozen? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. My computer is saying things like detect your microphone. Nobody can hear you. Okay. But you guys can hear me. Great. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, a group discussion. And this is kind of what I was just talking about. So maybe if you guys wouldn't mind just unmuting and um, sharing with me, um, how does the child welfare system think about that an adolescent? Have you guys heard any terms or um, have any experience with, with that? Or put it in the chat box. This is Frankie. I, I definitely think there's um, less forgiveness, if you will, when it's an adolescent that's so-called acting up. Um, like you said, there isn't a lot of effort to me to figure out what's behind the behavior. It's just looking at the behavior and that's really unfortunate. Absolutely. It's kind of like you just, when you're their advocate, you see the good in them and it's hard that that doesn't come out often and it's just so negative and it's hard to get that across. Less autonomy and more responsibility, absolutely child is expected to have their life plan figured out. Yes, like, you know, that's scary for children. And I even feel like sometimes when they're teenagers, that's even harder. And, and sometimes they have less support in the child welfare system. And then we're going to home visits and saying, what are you doing for the rest of your life? And, you know, they're like, what? <laughs> um, you know, I have a child who's going to be 18, aging out of residential, and she's in a different state. And she just, her question is like, what is, am, am I just going to be in Tennessee? Like when I'm 18, like what happens to me? Um, she has nobody. And it's just like, I, and I don't even have an answer for her. I, it's what's really sad is that, yeah, we can plan, 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 but I think we've all seen that sometimes plans fall through or um, someone said they were going to do something or some program was supposed to happen and it doesn't or they are confused with the plan and you know everybody's overworked and caseworkers have a big caseload and they can't help them as much as they should and so um it's really a interesting situation for adolescents to just be expected to know what they're doing um also thinking about trauma and their brain development and you know you know um teenagers at that age anyways aren't their brains aren't fully developed and they're not able to really do that. As a child, you still expected to have some support from your family or an adult um, guiding you. And um, we don't have that necessarily with children in this, this situation. And then they also have the trauma of what's happened and um, all of that combined. So they just really are um, sadly a little left out um, with, with us in the child welfare system. I think everybody tries to do the best they can, uh, but we know there's room for improvement always. And Kara said that the, um, the system feels that the adolescent should know better without fully understanding the context of their situation. Yes. Um, and you know, you always think about yourself, like did you know better when you were a teenager? And no, we didn't, we didn't either. And we had room to make mistakes and they just don't here in this situation. Yeah. Yeah think it's you know sometimes I have been the only voice at a table of 12 that's advocating for certain things and you have to be willing to stick to your guns on behalf of that child and, and ask for help from the CASA office. Absolutely I have felt that before too and you know feeling that often and I feel like especially with teenagers especially with adolescents when we're in there um, fighting for something and all the answers we have are you know they need this residential placement or there there's no placement for them or um, but they're breaking the law or you know they're doing all this wrong they're doing all these bad things and yeah I've felt that before too for sure 
Does anybody else have any um, statements about that? About how we, the child welfare system, views adolescents or talks about adolescents? Okay. I oh, Go ahead. can you hear me? Yep. Hey, um, yeah, I think, I think, I, this has been my only case, actually, um, and I'm working with a teen, but I often think about sometimes, like, if um, if I were advocating for a child in foster care who was an infant, and they were always really upset and um, crying a lot, then it would it, there would be more understanding that the child has been brought into a stress, is experiencing, like, a really stressful circumstance, but um, in the context with adolescents, if they're really upset, or then it's kind of like they're more expected, not kind of, it seems like they're more expected to kind of get a grip and compose themselves and, um, and, and act like they're not experiencing something extremely stressful as well. Absolutely. It's like, why are they looked at any different than any, any other teenager that we know? And that, that part of your life is extremely stressful anyways. And then we're expecting them to deal with all the other stuff and act like a, an, a complete adult. And like I said, they're not cute anymore. They're not a baby. They're not a little toddler. They're, you know, well, they're still cute. I think the teenagers are so cute. But, you know, as a system, I think that everybody's looking at them like this violent, aggressive, mouthy teenager. Um, but I think if you just really, if anybody gets to know a teenager with that kind of kind of hard shell um, and you get to know them a little bit more, there's so much more to them and it's really uh, cool to get to know them and find out um, what's bothering them and what they need instead of just looking at them like they're a delinquent. Okay, and um, yes, like Rochelle said, the, the trauma response is often put on back burner. We like, what did we forget about trauma? Like we're all trauma centered when they're babies and infants and toddlers, but when they become adolescents, we just think that they should have dealt with that by now. Absolutely, we kind of forget about it. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna move in to a small group activity. So I'm gonna put you guys into some breakout rooms and I'm going to go ahead and put in the questions in the chat so that you guys have access to them when you're in your breakout rooms. But um, so this is kind of the activity is kind of geared towards a narrative about adolescence. So we just talked about all the negative stuff that happened. So I want you guys to kind of think about what's been going on what you've learned over the last six weeks. And this is kind of a, you know, a fun little um, project, but it's kind of coming up with like a campaign slogan aimed at changing the narrative. So getting together in your groups and trying to come up with some kind of a slogan, some kind of a like, you know, something catchy, something that, you know, something fun, something, whatever, what, however you guys want to take that. Um, and we're trying to change the narrative around um, the adolescents in the child welfare professionals. So we're trying to, that's our audience is we're trying to change the narrative for child welfare professionals. And then you want to consider these questions. So like when you think of that word adolescence, what comes to mind? How does supporting healthy adolescent brain development contribute to our communities and society? How do social inequities connect to adolescent development and what can be done to address the connections? So if everybody can kind of think about those things, talk amongst yourself in your small group and just um, come up with a, you know, don't get too hung up on perfect campaign slogan or anything. I, you don't need to like make a sign, um, but just kind of think about changing the narrative. That's like what the point of this, um, the point of this activity is. Does anybody have any questions? There's not a, oh shoot, let me add Deb. She just got here. I hope she wasn't in there for too long. Hi Deb, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. I hope you weren't waiting in there forever. It's hard for me to pay attention to all the things on my screen. I'm sorry. We didn't have any service for a while. I just now got service. That's okay. So I was just about to put everybody in breakout rooms and I put um, in the, let me, I'll post it again because you wouldn't have had it. Um, 
Oh shoot, it's not letting me. Hold on. So we're going to break out into small groups and talk about a campaign slogan on changing the narrative of adolescents in the child welfare system. And so these questions I just put in the chat box would be kind of helpful for you guys to discuss in your groups. And so it's kind of just how do we change the narrative um, from the almost we talked about a lot of negative negativity is coming from children's services with how they're acting and their behaviors and um, those kind of things and how do we change that um, geared towards the child welfare system. Um, so I'm going to put you guys into a couple and like I said, don't worry too much about a campaign slogan, but just kind of what you guys discuss in your group about how you how we can change that narrative. All right, so I'm going to put you in the room. If you can find them. Where are they? Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to do, um, you'll be in about two or three people in a room. And I'm going to give you guys about, let me see how many minutes Jenny thinks this is going to take or wants me to give you. All right, so I'm going to give you about six to eight minutes in your breakout rooms and I'll give you like a two minute warning. All right.
All right. Did everybody have enough time? It seemed like maybe you didn't because everybody waited till the last second to come back. <laughs> uh, but that's good. Um, so we're going to talk about um, what you guys shared. And let me get back to my... Um, let me get back to my screen. Give me one second. Okay. All right. So I hope you guys had somebody who might feel comfortable um, talking and sharing. So I, there were four groups. So um, which group would like to go first with just a short description of what you guys talked about? We had a, um, in our group, I was in group one with um, Tanya and, Am is it pronounced Amni? Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't, um, we didn't get through everything or really get to talk too much in depth about like how to change the narrative. But some of the conversations that we had included like when we, what comes to mind when, um, when we hear the word adolescence is like hormones and emotions and drama and um, and Tanya even mentioned that she is a child welfare worker and so a lot of times like when she um, she let us know that when she gets a case with a teenager then sometimes your first thought is like oh no this is going to be a tough one because it can be a little um, with the adolescents, they can be a little more difficult to place and um, and they're just a little more savvy in, in her words. And so um, that kind of led us into talking about like supporting a healthy adolescent brain development can contribute to the community and society. And that's a way that you could sort of change the narrative by making everybody aware of what's actually taking place in the brain and um, and highlighting these opportune moments to when we when we start with children and with adolescents and people who are, who are just emerging into the society if if they have a better self-awareness of like the context of their situation and if everybody does um, and then that could only lead to more positivity in the future I think um, I've, I've this, these are only my words now. This isn't some, a conversation that really got in with the group, but to um, when people just have a, a when people have a, a larger understanding of um, why things are the way that they are, then then it's just a little easier, I think, to collaborate and cooperate in the future too. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that, that that makes a lot of sense because you saying that makes me made me think about the the mental health stigma that we have and how that's kind of what's helped that I think is what you just said too. Like what's going on in the brain, why why a, why your brain if someone has like for example like me I I struggle with anxiety so to have to have learned what's actually happening in my brain when something has triggered in my brain, why I do what I do. You know what I mean? Those things have helped me understand that it's, you know, you don't just think like, Oh, what's wrong with me or why can't I fix this? Um, I think that that helps. And then that helped everybody kind of understand, Oh, this isn't just someone overreacting or, Oh, just get over it. Or, you know, to learn that there's actually some stuff going on in your brain that helps, you know, helps you get to this spiraling or whatever you're dealing with, with your mental health, um, I think has been a big component on why mental health stigma has, has, you know, come down a little bit, not to anywhere where we would love it for it to be, but I think it's been helpful for that same reason, like educating people on what's happening. So it's kind of a similar thing, educating people on what's really happening in an adolescent's brain, and then what's really happening in an adolescent's brain who's experienced trauma. Those are even two different things. So to help people understand that would be an awesome first, you know, kind of education about it. All right, what about someone from another group? 
on some of the things everybody talked about or ways that you think you can change or things that even as a CASA or as a caseworker or where, whatever position you're in, you could start somewhere to change that. Well, we were group two, and that was Deb and Steph and myself, and we, we discussed similarly some of the, the emotional issues with puberty, um, that, you know, the kids obviously have difficulty controlling their emotions, they don't know how to express them, um, and it would be helpful to be able to provide them with tools as, as they're going through this. The other thing we talked about was promoting healthy development um, and because a lot of these kids are watching, you know, parents doing drugs and see domestic uh, violence. And so it would help be helpful for them to understand this whole mental health thing and help them understand positive ways of doing things. Um, and then we talked about this, the social, um, I forget the third question we looked at, but it had to do with social interactions, I think. And we discussed how the impact of poverty, a lot of these kids are um, in poor homes and, and they don't have the same opportunities for um, camps and participating in sports and that sort of thing. So for us to try and identify uh, ways for them to have social interaction is important. So um, Deb or Steph, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I think all that was really good. You did a great job. Okay, great. Anybody else? I know there are two more groups. Well, we were in group three and we, we talked about always find positive, focused on good and not the bad, and to talk to them and not about them. Um, and to, to basically what everybody else talked about was like educating everyone that they're to have a wider lens. They're not just their behavior. They're their kids, and to to actually listen to them and include them, and to actually see them, and not just their behavior. To have like a a wider lens when you're when you're looking at them. Absolutely, and I think it was a good um, to have a caseworker on here too, because I used to do. I was a caseworker too with child protection. And um, is it, was it Tanya? Is that Tanya who's the caseworker? Um, saying um, what I see too is that there's so, so much exhaustion that happens with a caseworker because of how much time is spent on, on, a, on a teen, on an adolescent, especially if they're in crisis or in residential or having ongoing behaviors. And so, um, you know, if there's some way to make the system better that we could have multiple, you know, have the whole support system, have the whole team, have people doing anything they can in any direction to almost help take that stress off of the caseworker because it is super hard to work with a teen in, in crisis if you're just a caseworker who has so many other things going on and um, you can't even put as much attention towards the teen because you probably would need to put attention towards the teen every day and, you know, as a caseworker, there's just, there's not time for that. So, I think, you know, as we talk about this team approach, um, that we could have people just kind of helping in all different angles and maybe like bringing in the CASA for more support than maybe they were doing or bringing in another uh, service provider to provide something that's outside of the box or something like that. I think about a lot because I know what that's like to have a child on your caseload that is taking up a lot of your energy and time because they're in crisis. So. I think that might be helpful too. Um, the last group, or did we kind of cover everything? Did anybody else want to speak from the last group? I feel like they kind of covered most of what I was going to say. Okay. All right. Okay, moving on. Anybody have any questions from what we've talked about so far? Nope. Okay. All right, so we're gonna um, shift the focus a little bit because in the next half of this, Jenny will be um, shifting the focus. So um, the last, what you guys have been learning about and focusing on in the first half of the training 
um, has been adolescent brain development. And next week, Jenny will start focusing on youth development lens and thinking about authentic youth engagement and how to promote brain gains. Um, so that'll be your second half um, of the training. So you've kind of done the learning about adolescent brain and now you're gonna think about how to engage, you know, engagement and promote and um, things like that for your second half of the training. Um, but what I would like to do um, right now, just um, as a group, we'll sit here quietly um, and you, um, I'd like for you to kind of reflect for two minutes on what Jenny has already presented to you in the last six, seven weeks um, so far and writing down t two key points that have kind of stuck out to you. What, what was something that you learned or had already known but thought about it in a different way? Um, just something that you thought was interesting, cool, you know, anything. So to think about that for a couple minutes and write it down or keep it in your mind um, on those two things that have uh, stuck out to you. Because then we're going to go back into some breakout rooms so that you guys can share. And then we'll come back together as a group. And that's really the last thing that we have for the, for the day. So I'm going to give you about two minutes to just think about those two things that have stuck, stuck, stuck out to you. Okay, I'm going to put everybody back in just the same breakout rooms and uh, you'll have about five minutes to talk and share um, about what your key points were and then we'll come back as a group. Stephanie, are you able to join the breakout room? Okay, let's share. Um, what did you, if anybody would like to share just kind of openly or in the chat or however you'd like to do it for a large group discussion on um, the things that stuck out to you and how you can incorporate them into your practice. A 
if you want me to, I'll go first. Um, we had, um, when you first told us to kind of isolate for a little bit and figure out what we remembered and so forth, there were two things that just jumped out at me instantly. One was um, the consequences, working with consequences, teaching the kids to think through and see what the consequences are going to be. Um, that has stuck with me in everything in my life right now um, with grandkids, et cetera. Um, the other thing was the circle when Jenny taught about doing the circle and then teaching them, you know, to use the circle. That was another big factor. And I think we all three agreed those were, were good things too. But we also talked about how before this class, we didn't think of the brain being mature at such an older age. We figured they were mature at a younger age and how you look at college age children and well, not children, but you know what I mean, um, college age kids and so forth and, and think that their brains aren't even fully mature, but they're making life decisions. That was Absolutely. It. I think that that's wild too. Like when you're, you know, in college and so much pressure and uh, what you're doing and going through and you learn that your brain is not fully developed. But then when you become after the age of fully developed, right, with 25 years old or something, I think you can actually look back on that and say, I know that my brain was not fully developed. I thought a lot differently. You know, I, re I feel like I, you know, when I was 30, I could have looked back and thought, I feel different than I did when I was 25. I think that's absolutely true. Great. Who else would like to share? I can, um, I was in group one with Kara and Tanya, and we talked um, a bit about um, the things that had stood out to us and we talked about um, really listening to the kids, um, really hearing them. I'm a teacher and so oftentimes I'm used to telling, giving them information rather than really listening to them. And so it was, um, we talked about that a little bit, but then something that Kara said um, during the conversation and we talked about this for quite a bit is um, we talked about how like all these kids, these teenagers are making normal decisions for teenagers for teens and it might be you know a little bit risky or whatever but an, an, a teenager at home a normal teenager it would you know maybe they would get grounded for a day or a week or whatever but a, a teen in foster care does this and it's big now you know it's a red flag it's means or cause you know maybe to be put in a group home it's paperwork it's huge and I don't think until she actually just said that, I really started thinking, oh my gosh, these are just, they're teenagers, right? I mean, they are always, something's always going on. I mean, it's all the words we've talked about today. And, um, and then they make one mistake and it's huge for them. So that's, that's an issue, but how do we fix that? That's, we got to that and then we got cut off. So can you tell us how to fix that? <laughs> Could you get on that? Please? All right, I'll get on it. Let me put it on my to do list here on my post it um, in front of my computer. Um, it's just, that is, <laughs> that is it. And I think that, you know, I think there's this uh, really cool training that someone does where they have you, um, they have you, they have you write like, you know, one or two of like the worst things you did as an adolescent mm -hmm. or teenager and they put it on, you know, you put it on post notes and then the trainer collects them all and you know, whatever. And then later in the training, she or he starts talking about, okay, we have adolescent and foster care and they do this behavior. And so the trainer is just reading things that the, participants have written down on their post-it and you know people kind of don't even really know what's going on because you're like oh what would you do and you're oh my gosh we need to like counseling and they need a you know more treatment and maybe they need to not be in that foster home anymore and then you find out that they're reading your the things that you did as a teenager and that's how we're responding to it and so it's kind of a cool little um, training to be involved in when you're thinking about all the things you did as a teenager and what's happened to you? Did you get kicked out? Like, did, did your parents put you on the curb when you, you know, had sex or smoked cigarettes or whatever? No, you weren't, you know, most of us, I I'm, I'm speak for everybody. Someone, you know, may have been um, dealing with things in their childhood, but you know, that's not how it's, it's normally treated children in, you know, making these teenage mistakes. Um, so that's an awesome point. All right. Anybody else have anything in their group? We talked about, we're, I was in group three, three with Debbie and Frankie, and we talked about a lot of things that the other people did, but um, we talked about the hot and cold cognition, 
using the the hand to kind of walk them through the stages of the development and the hot and cold cognition. And then I can't remember it was Frankie or Debbie had this really good thing about draw a picture of what your future, what you want your future to, to look like. And, and that was, I thought that was a really good idea. So. Yeah, that's a great idea. Just having them think ahead um, in a way that doesn't make them feel a lot of pressure. Okay, anybody We else? are uh, group four, and okay. we mostly were focusing on some of the ones that people mentioned before, but the two big ones that stuck out were the visuals of the relationship mapping and then also the brain. Um, relationships, um, as, as we've grown older, just seeing that communication and networking and support is, is huge for your future, so trying to pinpoint and help kids figure out their own relationships would be beneficial, we thought. Um, and then the brain, just thinking about self-awareness and assessment and reflection and um, that, that it would be beneficial to be able to, to understand yourself and what's going on and that, not, that we can change the language that we use with different ages to explain to the child what's going on because a lot of the time not understanding um, is just gonna create more problems. Absolutely, and I think we all know self-awareness is such a hard thing to learn really, to be really good at it. And um, like we said, like trying to teach an adolescent that is, it's a hard job and it requires us to be very consistent. It, it, children's brains don't necessarily understand what self-awareness is. It's really kind of fascinating because I can like even watch it in my daughter. She's nine and I was really proud of her because we try to teach that self-awareness or like even like body like awareness of like trying to be safe when you're playing and you know aware of what's behind you or around you or dangers and they just don't get that. And so it's just this repetitive like are you aware of your surroundings? Are you aware of what's going on? And you know, she were like walking home from the library and she says, I was being very self-aware of my environment. And I realized I, when I tried to ch jump on the monkey bars, I was making sure that it wasn't loose. So I didn't fall off of it, you know? So it's just interesting that she like, you know, but if you do it and you talk about it enough, they do, they do think about it. Kids can learn that and they can learn how to take care of their bodies on their own or ask for help on their own. It, it's just a lot of consistency to teach them so that they know what to do. And I think that that's where we get exhausted. And we're, and you know, we're the ones working, especially with children in the child welfare system. They don't even have their parent or, you know, helping. It's, you know, we're not, you know, it's hard to provide that as a parent anyways. And then we're dealing with children who are very limited on their um, supports. And so I think, like we said, as many people that you can get surrounded and like Rochelle said, communicating with, uh, build the biggest circle you can build for these children. So they have multiple ways and places and people to t turn towards, I think is really um, something that would be helpful. Okay, anybody else, any last thoughts or questions? Um, Jenny wants me to make sure I remind everybody that you can complete your makeup assignments on Google Classroom if you need to do that. Um, and like she said, you'll be kind of shifting in um, for the second half of the training when she's back next week. So um, that's all that I have for everybody today. Um, I hope that um, I, I changed my, my name from Ginny, but I hope that it was an okay training and I worked out the kinks, but you guys were great. Um, it's awesome to have so much discussion. I love when people um, talk. I actually teach a, an OU class on Zoom and it's a lot harder <laughs> to, get, to get college students to talk to me. Um, so I really appreciate the discussion. You guys did a great job. Um, and uh, email Jenny with any questions. She'll be back next week. And um, I'll see some of you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.